Welcome again. I'm Claire Wandro, the co-chair of the Committee on Lectures and a chair of the World Affairs Series Planning Committee. And it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. James Zogby is author of the newly released Arab Voices, What They Are Saying to Us and Why It Matters, as well as What Ethnic Americans Really Think and What Arabs Think. He is founder and president of the Arab American Institute and co-founded several other organizations serving the Arab American community, including the Palestine Human Rights Campaign, the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, and Save Lebanon, a private nonprofit humanitarian relief organization. Following the signing of the Israeli-Palestinian Peace Accord in Washington, Zogby served as co-president of Builders for Peace, a private sector committee to promote U.S. business investment in the West Bank and Gaza. He writes a weekly column on U.S. politics, Washington Watch, for the major newspapers of the Arab world. Please join me in welcoming James Sogby. Well, thank you very much. I, um, listening to the lineup of what's coming, you don't have to go to classes and you don't have to listen to any of the folks who come Trump and through wanting to run for president. You can just go to real interesting lectures all the time and, uh, and get an education that way. It's a, it's a remarkable opportunity to have that kind of lineup of folks coming through and visiting. Um, and I, I would like to be here for the Freedom Rider. Uh, I think that's a, an incredible part of our history that uh, you, you have a great opportunity to learn a lot from some of these folks. Well, I thank you for coming tonight, and I thank the school for inviting me uh, and the lecture series for hosting me. Uh, I have a book, and it's a book I love talking about because I actually enjoyed writing this one. Uh, I've done other books before, and uh, they can be, um, they, they, they oftentimes start as a book idea, and then they end up at some point being the damn book. Um, and th then you're done with it, and you think you're done with it, and then you're not because you've got to talk about it. But this one was fun from the beginning because it was a, a chance <coughs> that uh, Paul Grave McMillan gave me to tell some stories about people I knew and experiences I'd had, and things I've done over the last 40 years that I've wanted to share for a long, long time. And, um, and they were important to me to tell those stories because the Middle East has become increasingly important and visible in our world, um, and yet we don't know it. So when I'd hear a conversation about Saudi Arabia, I'd say, that's not the Saudis I know. Or when I'd hear people talking about Palestinians, I'd say, they're not the people I lived with in the camps, or they're not the people that I worked with in, in the West Bank or, or in Gaza. Um, when I'd hear Lebanon talked about, as I would because I talk about it a lot on television and debate a lot of folks, I'd say, y y y just, y just going there and hanging out in a bar with folks who, who you know, speak English to you is not going to help you understand that country. Uh, you need to know the people and, and know them uh, from all the different parties in Lebanon to understand it. So having a chance to share those stories was important, but more than that, more than that, I got to digest and distill some of our polling data and make it usable and, 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 and user-friendly. Uh, to an American audience. I've done books before with polling and sometimes they can get a little bit numbing as you go from page to page and chart to chart. The charts here are sparse and, the, and I find them, I hope, useful uh, because they tell a story all by themselves. Um, polling is, I call it, the respectful science because what it does is I, it talks to people. We talk to 4,000 Arabs every time we poll from Morocco to Iraq. We not only talk to them and listen to them, but we respect every single thing they tell us. No opinion doesn't count. And you organize the data by gender and by country and by education uh, <coughs> and by age, and you look at it, and it comes to life on the page. And what you hear are voices talking at you. When you ask them, what's the most important thing about your country, or what are the, what's the thing you want most in your life? You can actually hear 4,000 people telling you, this is what counts. This is what matters to me. And, and that's important for us as Americans because we talk about the Arab world a lot. It's in the news a lot. But we don't understand it at all. Um, I look at it this way. Since the end of Vietnam, 
we have sent more money, we've sent more weapons, we've sent more troops and fought more wars, lost more lives, have more at risk in the Middle East than anywhere else in the world. And yet it's a part of the world we know so little about. And we engage in situations and get up to our eyeballs and even beyond our eyeballs in those situations. And we don't know, have a clue. When we started the Iraq War, National Geographic did a survey. They found 11% could identify Iraq on the map. In 2009, after we'd lost 4,000 lives, the same survey was redone. It had shot up to 37%. Uh, I mean, we lost 4,000 lives in a country where 37% of us could find it? When we ask questions in our polling, we get answers that just reveal to us the, a shocking lack of awareness. 60% of Americans think Iran is an Arab country. 60% um, about think that Pakistan's an Arab country. Less than a third know the year that Israel declared its independence and fought its war of independence. Um, and on and on and on. Uh, <coughs> when we ask Americans, why do Arabs dislike us, 80% say, because they hate our values. When we poll Arabs, we find 65% say they love our values. And about the same number say they like our people, and they like our culture, and they like our movies, and they like our science and technology, and they love our educational system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They really like us. I feel like, uh, what's her name, Sally Fields getting the Academy Award. They really like us. What they f are afraid of is that we don't like them. And what they don't like is our policy toward them, because what our policy toward them says is, in fact, we don't like you. <coughs> people, <coughs> people at the end of the day don't judge you by what you say about yourself. They judge you by how you treat them. And so their policy, their attitude toward policy on Iraq is like 1% favorable, and Palestine is 2% favorable, and treatment of Arabs and Muslims is like 3 or 4% favorable. The numbers are shockingly low. Because, frankly, they deserve shockingly low numbers because the policies are so bad. So overall, <coughs> when you look at the numbers, how do they feel about America? The numbers are low. And what pushes them down is the policy. I wrote an article back then called It's the Policy Stupid because what had happened was Gallup had done this survey right after 9-11, and what Gallup found was that uh, favorable attitudes toward America were very low. But that was the only question they asked, was, how do you feel about America? People said, oh, negative, hostile, fa unfavorable. Well, at the time, that gave grist to the mill of, of speculation about, well, I was on Meet the Press with Charles Krauthammer, who said, oh, they hate us. You know why they hate us? Because they got teacher, preachers in the mosques who teach them to hate us. And you know why the preachers are teaching them to hate us? Because they hate us. Well, it was a little too tautological for me, and so I thought there's got to be something here to unravel and figure out what all this means. I thought, I said, you know, asking people how do they feel about America is the wrong question at the wrong time. It's sort of like asking a woman who just threw her husband out for being a serial cheater, what do you think of men? She's going to give you a negative answer. But if you said, what do you think of fathers? Or what do you think of, of brothers? Or what do you think of sons? Or what do you think of uncles? You might get different answers. So that's when we pulled it apart and said, what do you think of the American people? What do you think of American culture and values of democracy and freedom, et cetera? And that's when we got those remarkably favorable numbers. <coughs> but the negative numbers that we got, the numbers toward policy, are what dragged everything down. But folks didn't know that. They didn't have a clue. The, and what surprised me actually was when in talking with people in Congress or people in the administration that it was revelatory to them that they might not like us because of our policy. And I would think, what planet are you from that you wouldn't have figured that one out? I mean, not only did the American people not know where Iraq was and still don't know two-thirds of them where it is, kind of over there somewhere, but when we went into Iraq, we didn't have an idea on earth what we were doing. And yet we sold it to the American people. The lie was not weapons of mass destruction. That wasn't the lie. The lie was it would be over in six days. The lie was six months and we'd be out of there. The lie was it would only cost one to two billion dollars and Iraqi oil would kick in. The lie was there'd be 
flowers in the street greeting our soldiers, and the people would celebrate us as liberators, and democracy would flourish and light up the whole Middle East. That's what they told us. I think that that's what some of them believed. <coughs> it turned out to be a total lie, and they didn't have a clue what they were talking about. And we believed them because most of the American people just didn't have any understanding either. I tried to have a debate in the Democratic Party in 2003. I went with a resolution. I'm on the Executive Committee and the Resolutions Committee. Um, and I said, let's have, a, let's have a debate on whether we should go to war in a country we don't know and don't understand. And should, so the resolution was unless we, we uh, unless the administration makes clear the cost consequences in terms of commitment and what the expect, expected um, uh, consequences of this war are, we should not go to war. I was ruled out of order. That's when it was that same meeting that Howard Dean gave his speech. I want to know why the leaders of my party are falling in step, you know, whatever. And I'm from the Democratic wing of the Democratic Party and excited a whole bunch of people. Got himself a little too excited, I think, um, in the process. But the result was that we ended up going into a war in a country we didn't understand, thinking that it would be, as Ken Adelman said when we debated each other on Crossfire, a cakewalk. So I, I relished the opportunity to write the book because it was an opportunity to say to my fellow Americans, <coughs> this is an area of the world that's too important for us. We're too heavily invested in it. Too many presidents have their presidencies determined by their success or failure in that part of the world. It's become even more important because of the democratic revolt that's now spreading across the region, and yet Despite the importance of this part of the world, we don't understand it, and we have to understand it. Now, why don't we understand it? Well, I, the first reason we don't understand it is because our education level is so low. I mean, frankly, we do not study about the Middle East. There are 2,400 four-year college and universities in, in America. 60 of them have Middle East studies programs, 60. 320 only teach Arabic on any level at all. And only 2,400 kids study Arabic at a level that gives them proficiency in the language. Less than 1% of high school kids study Arabic. And I think I met every one of them in the last couple months. If the educational level is low, and, and it is, studies done by the Middle East Studies Association, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs have sort of analyzed textbooks and looked at them up and down and found them sorely lacking. After 9-11, they did a study and they found that kids were asking all the right questions in school, but the textbook didn't have the answers and the teachers didn't know where to find the answers because they'd never studied the region either. I mean, go back my generation, and I see some folks here in the audience, uh, a few, who are of my age, and therefore, you had the same textbook I did, which we called at the time Stone Age Man to Ike. It started with Stone Age Man in Europe. Because, of course, God could not possibly have made the first man there in Africa or something, right? It had to be, had to be Europe. Um, and so it was southern France. The caves in southern France was the first man. And then you go from the first man to the Greeks and the Romans. And then you go to the Holy Roman Empire. And then you go to the Dark Ages. And then you go from the Dark Ages to the Renaissance and the Renaissance to the emergence of the nation state and then America. And that's history. Started with White Stone Age man and ends up with Ike. There, Africa was the dark continent. That's what we called it, the dark continent. Nothing happened there, just jungles and disease and stuff like that. People with knives and spears. They made good movies though. Because when you ran out of Indians to kill, you could take out some African natives. That's what we call them, natives. Um, I just went, came back from Britain. I was speaking in London. Uh, and one of the audiences I addressed with my book was the foreign office, uh, the, what the, you know, their foreign ministry. And it was kind of cool because the kid who, who was my host there at the foreign ministry said, let's go up. I call everybody a kid. I'm sorry. He was like in his 30s. Um, but when all my kids are older than them, I mean, what do I so this young man took me up the back stairs. He said, this is the East India wing. And I want you to see the mural at the top of the stairs. 
And so we get up to the top of the stairs, and there at the top of the stairs is this incredible mural, like the heavens opened, and the clouds are there, and sitting on one cloud on one side is Victoria, half-naked Victoria. She's Britain, right? And she's like this, gracious as all, get out. Um, and uh, the other side of the picture is a black, brown, yellow, and red man bearing platters of gifts to Victoria. That's how they saw themselves. And we actually didn't see ourselves much different. It was our oil. I mean, it, like the world was for us. <coughs> and our history reflected that. I mean, that you go from the Greeks and Romans to the, the, the Holy Roman Empire to the Dark Ages to the Renaissance, like it's like all of a sudden things got quiet and then they like perked up again. A couple centuries later, something happened. I mean, knowledge and civilization passed south in that period. What was the Dark Ages? It wasn't dark. Just the candle got lit someplace else, blew out in your place and went someplace else. And when it then came back in the Renaissance, guess what sparked knowledge? It was Islamic civilization that sparked knowledge. I mean, art and architecture of the Mediterranean region is Islamic. Baroque music is Islamic. There is so much of even <coughs> the short stories and the folk tales and so much of what comes into European culture at that point has those roots. Th there was a, a mixing of civilizations in the Mediterranean region that created greatness. But you wouldn't know it when we studied it. Only picture of the Arab in the textbook was two pyramids and a camel, guy and a camel sitting in front. And I think now, in hindsight, it might have been product placement because you wouldn't have known what camel cigarettes were. It's like, you, man, I'll take those. But what are those two triangles on there? Oh, no, I know, because in fourth grade I had it in the book, the, the, you know, the, what do they call them? The, the pyramids. Um, China, the only mention of China was a picture of the Great Wall. And there was nothing about the Great Wall. <coughs> it wasn't interesting. It was a section on Marco Polo. Not the pool game, but the guy who we believe discovered China and opened it up. It wasn't lost, number one. Number one. Number two, that's not where it came from. We became beneficiaries of the wealth of the East because of the Silk Road and traders that moved from East to West and brought it themselves. But our story wouldn't work if they did it. For our story to make sense, we had to find it and bring it back. Like Columbus discovered America, also wasn't lost. But once we found it, it was ours. And so that sense of, that's the history we learned, and that's how we taught it. They didn't count. There were no African civilizations. Arab and Islamic civilization didn't count, didn't ta get taught. There was no China. It was just a great wall with riches that came to us, and they were now ours. I mean, the Italians, w <coughs> what the hell would they be eating if it hadn't been for, for, for the New World and for China? No spaghetti, no sauce, no tomatoes. I mean, think about it. And all of this comes from somewhere. Martin Luther King used to say that by the time I get up in the morning, shower, shave, eat breakfast, get in my car and drive to work, I'm the beneficiary of the labor and the product of 43 countries in the world. But you wouldn't know it or that it matters that we understand those people to go to our schools. Because our, our history is, is us-centric. But us happen to be all these other people in the world. And yet, you wouldn't know it. We can get away with it, except for one thing. We're now at war. And we're now engaged deeply in that region, in country after country after country, whether it's economic ties or political ties or geostrategic interests, or the fact that, like I said, we got troops, or the fact that we're making incredible commitments in foreign aid, we are deeply invested in that region and aren't going away anytime soon. And therefore, the fact that we have to know that world is critical. <coughs> but our knowledge level is so low, we're not equipped to understand. Now, if the knowledge level were simply low, I'd say, well, then you start with, I don't know, and so let me learn something. And when we first started polling on this issue, here's what we found. 
We found 75 plus percent of the American people about a decade ago used to say, when asked the question, do you know enough about the Arab world or do you need to know more? 75 percent would say, I don't know enough, I need to know more. In the most recent polling we do, it's down to about 50 percent. That means that like half the American people think they know enough and don't need to know more and yet can't find Iraq on a map. I mean, think about it. And it's a deep partisan split. And I'm not here to insult anybody, but I just want you to understand that what's happened is that there has become a partisan divide on this issue that is worrisome. Among Democrats, 73% say, I don't know enough, I need to know more. Among Republicans, 82% say, I know enough, I don't need to know any more. And if you're listening to Newt Gingrich and Sarah Palin and company talk about the Arab world, see, here's the problem. You start with the popular culture. You don't know anything, and, and, and most of us don't. You begin with not knowing from knowledge, that is to say knowledge that was conveyed through academic, uh, in, in an academic environment. You start with that, and then what happens is that you build on that popular culture, which creates a sense of knowing. So, oh, yeah, I know them Arabs. I watch them on television. They're the murderers, right? They're the guys that are they're the terrorists. Well, the, the, the oil shakes, right? Them oil shakes, the guys that got all that oil over there. I had a neighbor. in Phil I, I lived in Philadelphia for eight years. It was, it was nice. I had a good time with my wife and kids, and, and we enjoyed the city. It was quite a, an unusual place. I mean, there was a really rich, deep ethnic heritage in the different neighborhoods. And, um, uh, and after about eight years, I moved out in the little country area in Pennsylvania because I was teaching at a state college, and the guy next door used to come over and look at me all the time. He just get out of his house and look. Finally, one day, about three days later, he came over to me and said, uh, you live there? And I said, you mean here? Yes, sir. We moved in. Um, and he said, no, no, no. I mean Philadelphia. I said, yeah. He said, you live there with your kids? I said, yeah. He said, and you weren't afraid? And I said, no. He said, but people are getting murdered there every day. And I said, well, actually, no, no they're not. Cause I do. I read it in the paper. Every day I'm reading about them getting murdered in Philadelphia. How'd you leave your kids there? Well, it's like it's true. In the Harrisburg newspaper, which is the one he read, there'd be a Philadelphia story about people getting murdered. There were no stories about the Italian market in South Philly, which is actually like going to southern Italy. It's, it's an incredible other world experience that has never changed a bit in all those years that, that it's been there. Or the German neighborhood or the Irish neighborhood or the, the, what they call the, the Lincoln Drive, which is where the black bourgeoisie freed slaves lived and built this incredible culture um, that has survived. They have their own debutantes and their own, it's a whole different social world. Or the, the Quaker communities in Chestnut Hill. I mean, there's all of this there, but that's not in the newspaper. That's not on the evening Harrisburg News. And all he knew was somebody got murdered in Philadelphia every day. And so that was the story he knew, 4.5 million people. And he had summed the whole thing up in that there's violence there every day. Well, he's right in the sense that there is violence there every day. But we were living in a country area where in Hawkersville, PA, there were 52 people. And it was me, my wife, two kids, and... And, uh, and him and his wife and then a couple of other families. And so, you know, it was scary to him. Well, if the only Arab you see on television is a, is a terrorist or a, or a... You don't see Ahmed, the doctor who gets up in the morning and delivers some babies. You don't see Maryam, the, 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 the mother who stays home with her kids and, and, and educates them and cares for them. I mean, you see Ahmed who straps a bomb on himself and goes to the market. That's the one you see. If that's the only image you get, then that becomes the knowledge you have. And so what stereotypes do is create information and replace. They take up the space where information can come because if you've seen that stuff enough time, you believe it. That becomes what defines the reality for you. And then if on top of that you have political leaders coming around saying, that's not just the image you see on television, that's the truth. And, and they're running for president, they're not going to lie to you. And so that's the image you get, and that is the reality you see, and that becomes certi certainty. And the dangerous thing about it is that not knowing is one thing, 
But not knowing and thinking you know, that's something else. And being certain you know, that's even more dangerous. And that's the reality that we're in. And if people think they know the Middle East, I mean, last summer when we went through that whole thing over Park 51, it started about a, a neighborhood in New York and whether there ought to be an Islamic community center there. That's how it started. It was about a real estate and, and building issue. People in Manhattan solved it. They said, it's fine, just build it. 13 blocks away, they passed the zoning requirements, they passed the city council, it was just fine. But Newt Gingrich got hold of it, and Sarah Palin got hold of it, and they started going around the country with it, and they made it into a victory mosque. It was a symbol of Islam conquering America, and they're rubbing our nose in it. It's like putting a, 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 a what do you call it, a, a, what did Newt Gingrich say? Um, it, it, he said it would be the same as, as putting an Auschwitz something, I forget what it was, it was something just totally bizarre. But there were thousands of people believing that and accepting it, and it caused incredible trauma for the Muslim community, but it had nothing to do with reality. New York had already zoned it and said, this is fine. But people were sure it became an issue in congressional races all over the country, whether there ought to be a victory mosque. You know there's a mosque in Cedar Rapids, oldest mosque in America. Have they conquered Iowa yet? No? You all aren't secret Muslims. I see the ashes. Um, that's like you're, you're not afraid the Muslims aren't going to get you, huh? Because of the Cedar Rapids Mosque? Oh. They've been here for 100 years and they're doing just fine and everybody's sitting pretty. Uh, but that wasn't the story we got told. And that's the danger, is that people believed it. And the polling numbers then went crazy. That's when we got that, do you favorable, unfavorable attitude of, uh, toward Muslims. When we polled after the Park 51, Democrats, 54% said favorable attitude, 34% said unfavorable attitude, Republicans said 12% favorable, 85% unfavorable. That's scary. And, 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 and it's something that we ought to take seriously, is that there's that kind of incitement taking place. And so the book to me was an opportunity to say, this part of the world is important. It is increasingly important for us as Americans. We are deeply engaged in this part of the world. <coughs> Going back several presidents, um, from Nixon and Carter and, um, I skipped Gerald Ford, sorry. Gerald, he was president for him. Gerald Ford, and, and, and I'll stop right there because I might make another, no. He's not forgettable actually, but because he was a very nice person. Um, and, um, and because it is important, we need to know. And because we don't know, we get in trouble. We make policy decisions that are based on not knowing, like, for example, Iraq, or like, for example, the systematic way we have dealt with the Palestinian issue, systematically wrong, continuously wrong or the way we've dealt with reform issues in the Middle East, which just to me is, is bizarre, just bizarre. I mean, George Bush advocates democracy, sends his speakers out. They, I was in Jordan, 2005. Uh, we had just polled in Jordan. Our U.S. favorable rating in Jordan was 5%. That's kind of low. I mean, it's like within the margin of error of zero. Um, or it could be nine, um, but it was five. And um, so Liz Cheney comes to the World Economic Forum at the Dead Sea, and she starts her speech. It's 2005. She says, for the last 60 years, American policy has been based on a fundamental error. And I could see people in the audience going, let's see, 2005, 95, 85, uh -huh. and then they counted backwards to 45, and they said, oh, she's going to talk about the Arab-Israeli conflict. She was previewing Condoleezza Rice's speech that was going to be given a couple months later in Cairo. And she said, yes, we have supported monarchs and dictators against the people. I said, but you're in Jordan. They have a king. It's like it's the only country in the region right now that likes you, that treats, and yet the people hate you. What are you doing here? What are you thinking is going to happen? And people started booing her. She like couldn't figure it out. It's like, you're not the white knight on the charger right now. 
You're the guys who brought us Iraq. You're the guys who brought us the suffering for the Palestinians. You're the guy, don't you get, you're the guys who brought us Abu Ghraib and torture. And you're, you know, it's like, so what, what, what do we do? And, and the point was, was that we then went to all these leaders and told them, you must support our policies. Do not complain about Abu Ghraib. They became culprits in rendition. They became way stations on the road to rendition. We didn't want to torture, so we turned them over to them, and they tortured them for us. And when Israel's mulling Gaza or the, or the Palestinians elsewhere, we're telling them, be quiet and don't say anything about it. I was asked during the Egyptian uprising by a reporter who said, do you think our standing would go up in Egypt if we, if we, if we dumped Mubarak? I said, you got the question backwards. We're not unpopular in Egypt because we supported Mubarak. He's unpopular in Egypt because <coughs> he supported us. That's the problem. And yet we don't even understand that. That they might somehow, well, we're all worried about Israel's are kind of, Israel's upset, you know, because President Obama spoke about settlements and, and you know, they're, they're kind of upset. We have to be very careful. We don't want to make the Israelis any more upset. The Arab world is furious with us. But we don't care enough to figure out what we have to do to change. Oh, yes, we do. We're going to have a public information program. Um, what's her name? Uh, uh, Hillary Clinton the other day goes to Congress and says, problem is we're not spending enough money on public diplomacy and on our television programs. We've been polling on this television network that America runs, Al Hurra, right? It is a blip. It is in the margin of error. I mean, it's like you get two, three people in a country say they watch it out of like a four, four five, six hundred that you poll. We spent $650 million thinking that if we started a TV channel, they'd like us. That's not the problem. They already watch American television. <coughs> Actually, they, like show, they watch shows that they like. I mean, our best product for export are our television shows. They're watching Law and Order. They're still watching old Gunsmoke. And they, wa they love those shows. What they don't want is to watch El Hura, which is a propaganda network, which is going to tell them stuff that they don't really, they know isn't true, that they don't care to watch. And yet we're spending $650 million thinking if we just spend a little bit more, they'll like us better. Mm. I, I don't, I sometimes don't get the thinking that goes on about this. It's like usually when you make a mistake on something and you bang your head against the wall, at some point you say, this hurts, I'm going to stop doing it. But keep doing it over and over again doesn't make sense. So the book, to me, was an important opportunity to say, we've got to change direction on this. When Charlotte Beers was, first got the job public diplomacy czar for the Bush administration, she called me and she said, I'm going to the Middle East on a listening tour. What should I do? And I said, we already answered your question. Listen. Listen. Just go and listen. Ask people questions. Find out what they're going to say. I thought she was going to be real good because she was an advertising executive. She sold <coughs> her two big products were Uncle Ben, Uncle Ben's converted rice and, um, and um, um, oh, head and shoulders. No relationship between the two. Um, I never thought about that before, head and shoulders and Uncle Ben's. Anyway, because sometimes it looked, anyway. The, um, um, so she, I figured if she understands the marketplace, <coughs> She will understand that you can't sell a product unless you know the market you're selling the product to. That makes sense. That's what advertisers do. So she says, what do I do? I said, listen, understand the market that you're trying to sell the product to. And then figure out what's wrong with the messaging right now. Ah, good idea, good idea. So she goes on a trip. It was to be a 10-country trip. She started in Morocco. She said, I'm here to talk about brand America. And let's, I want to have a conversation with you about brand America. And they immediately said, we want to talk about Palestine and your policy toward Palestine. And she said, I'm not here to talk about that. And she got upset with them. And then she went on to Egypt. And when they did the same thing in Egypt, she said, I'm going home. And she cut the trip short. She didn't want to listen. She didn't want to learn. And so she goes home and she does her first ad, which was a full-page newspaper ad that most Arab newspapers wouldn't carry. It was an Osama bin Laden wanted dead or alive poster with a million-dollar reward. Now, how clever was that? It might have played well in Dodge City, 
But it didn't play really well in Arab capitals. They didn't want to put it in the newspaper at all. Number one, it would made him more popular than he already was. It gave him free publicity. And number two, it was like the cowboy thing that we think is cute, but they don't. So, but she wouldn't listen. And that has been a successive problem of administrations, is simply not listening. And the result, therefore, is that our reform agenda was wrong, our policy towards several issues were wrong, and we kept digging a hole for ourselves deeper and deeper and deeper. And so when I had the chance to write the book, to say, let's stop for a minute, take a deep breath, take a look at this region. Let's understand it a little bit and understand why we get in trouble, understand why we don't understand, and understand what we can do to get it better. I was happy to do it, happy to write it, happy to talk about it, <coughs> and happy to end with a couple chapters that are called Getting It Right, which look at uh, things that we are doing that actually get it right. And when President Obama went to Cairo, for example, he got it right. He, it, the speech was a, a brilliant roadmap for change. First time an American president actually understood what needed to be done and said what needed to be done. Now, he said in the speech, the speech alone doesn't make things happen. And he's right, because it hasn't happened. Um, but that doesn't deny the validity of the speech and the content of the speech as providing us a way forward. And our aid programs, which used to be like that story we used to tell about the Boy Scout who helped the little old lady across the street except she didn't want to go. You know, that's what our aid programs were like. We'd like design these programs for people that didn't want them and programs that they didn't need, programs that we thought in the bowels of the State Department, this is a great one, we'll do this one, $70 million on this one, and, and the country in question never asked for it, didn't want it, and didn't know what to do with it when they got it. I mean, for example, I was in the, I worked with Vice President Gore, you mentioned that in the introduction about Builders for Peace, and um, it was, uh, I went to Gaza the first time to see this project that we had built with AID funds, with AID funds, it was a housing project in Gaza with a big billboard out front said, gift from the American people to the people of Gaza. Average unit sold for $94,000 a unit in a part of the world where the per capita income was $600 a person. I mean, who the hell thought of that one? And what were they thinking? Or when we worked together with the French and the, and the, uh, and the Dutch, because Gaza, the refugee camp in Gaza had no sewage. And so everybody, it was open sewage in the streets. I mean, it's just gross and no paved roads. It's just one of the most depressing places on earth. The Israelis occupied it for all those years, never paved roads, never built sewage. And, um, and so <laughs> the, um, uh, the uh, French came in and paved the roads and the uh, Dutch came in and, uh, tore up the roads to lay the sewer pipes, but there wasn't enough money to pave, repave the roads, and so you got muddy, muddy roads with, uh, um, with sort of torn up stuff, and it's, it's, uh, it's still a mess. But nobody talked to the people. Nobody talked to anybody. We, didn't, we don't listen and we don't talk. We simply decide to do. And, um, and then other people are the, the, the recipients of what we do. I remember I was, I, one of the things I did with this Builders for Peace was when the world, uh, when the, what do you call it, the uh, economic summit occurred that was the culmination of the first year of the peace process in Casablanca, I got to chair the session on the Palestinian economy and there were three ministers on the stage with me and they made their presentations about what Palestine needs and what Palestine has to have and what we have to do and whatever. And at the end of the speech, some kid comes up to me and he says, hi, could I meet the ministers? And he was so eager, I was like, like, and who are you? And he said, oh, I'm the guy that just got the $9.3 million contract from AID to teach Palestinians entrepreneurial skills. It's Palestinians teaching them entrepreneurial skills? I mean, these are people who like you give them two nickels and they open a store. And three nickels and they're buying yours. I mean, this is not a culture that needs to learn entrepreneurialism. It's like it's in the culture. What they need is open markets. They need free access to import and export. They need the Israeli occupation off their backs. They need opportunities to get resources. And they need micro lending so they can start small businesses on their own. This kid had worked for AID for eight years. 
He left AID for a year. They sent out an RFP, which is a request for proposal. He wrote the proposal. He got the grant, and now he was coming over to teach Palestinians. He'd never worked a day in his life as an entrepreneur, but he was going to teach him because he was an American. And of course, we know how to teach everybody everything. And, and so the ministers were furious. They said, we were promised aid. We were not promised programs that we never asked for. But that doesn't happen anymore. When Hillary Clinton went to the Forum of the Future in Morocco last year, and when she went again this year to Doha and announced our programs, every single one was a partnership program. Every single one. Partnering with groups there and creating demand-driven programs that meet people's real needs. And one of the most magnificent things we do right now is the MEPI program. <coughs> it started under George W. Bush. It was not functioning well, but then when um, um, Karen Hughes in the last couple of years changed it around and started it on the right track, and now it's just blossomed into this incredible program that gives, brings thousands and thousands and thousands of young people here every year, like almost 10,000 kids from the Arab world and, and beyond to study in America as high school kids, as college kids, as some in grad schools, some in career training that are out of school. I never forgot that picture, the picture of Bill Clinton shaking hands with Jack Kennedy at the White House. And, and, and it wasn't that I love Bill Clinton or love Jack Kennedy, but it was a picture that always reminds me of how a moment and it can change the life direction of a person and give them a sense of worth and possibility. And the kids I've met through the MEPI program, some of whom I still stay in touch with, some Tunisian kids, girls, young girls who are now in their mid-20s and are, you know, one of them runs a business and the other one is doing a training program and they're talking to me about what they did in the, in the revolution because what, what, what for them happened when they came to America was they got a sense of themselves and of the possibility that they could do things in their lives and break th free of some of the traditions that had bound them as people. And MEPI makes that happen. And that's a good thing. That's the contribution we make to the world. That's the stuff we do well. And the other thing we do well, and this is something that some of you might not get or, or appreciate, is our, our corporations. I mean, yes, American corporations are overseas to make money, but they also provide an opportunity to share in America's way of life for people all across the, 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 the Middle East and, again, beyond. I, I remember talking to a guy one time who told me, he said, you know, the, the problem with you Americans is that, he said, you're different than the Japanese, the, the Chinese, and the, and the Germans. They just sell products, but you sell a way of life, and people want part of that. So when you go into a shopping mall in Saudi Arabia right now and you see a kid wearing jeans and a basketball jersey and a Yankee baseball hat, he's buying a piece of America. Or when they go to a Starbucks in the mall or they go to a McDonald's and they take the family to McDonald's at night, it's not because the food's better. It's because they're doing an American thing. And they know that the standard that they will get in that restaurant will be exactly the same as the standard that you get in a Mexican McDonald's or in a New York City McDonald's because that's a standard of service that is a trademark of American products abroad. And we might poo-poo it here, but the fact is, is that they appreciate that and see that as something that we export to the world, a style of doing business fundamentally different than everybody else. They kind of wish we did that with our foreign policy and treated everybody the same way by the same standard. But the fact that our businesses do it sends a message. <coughs> I, think, <coughs> I think our best diplomats are our business people sometimes. They're the people who send the best message about America to the world. And our universities are doing some of the same things some great programs being exported abroad. And then there are groups like World Affairs Councils or, or Great Decision Series run by the Foreign Policy Association or the Model Arab League. <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry. It's an annoying cough and I can't stop it. Um, that are run for college kids all across the country that introduce them to an Arab, um, uh, an Arab country and and kids I've met who've gone through that model Arab League program end up so embraced of that in that country that they never want to let it go. And they end up going to visit and doing things there. And I've hired some of those kids. And they tell me that's where they got their start in the model Arab League. So there are people doing it right. There are people making change. There are people 
trying to learn and improve how we understand and relate to the rest of the world. And frankly, it can't come too soon, the change we need. Um, you get a chance when the folks come tromping through the state in it this year to ask them questions, tough questions, I hope, about how are you going to lead and what are you going to do. And if you think you can run the country and if you think you can lead America and the world, how are you going to deal with these complex issues that we're dealing with? And don't give me pat formulas or give me stuff that speaks to where we were and what we did that failed. I mean, the fact is, is that there has to be an accounting for the failures of the past and a change that makes a different future for all of us. Um, and I could just cheapen the whole thing right now by saying, and the best place to start is by buying my book. But, hey, that's what I do. I tell folks, I say, you know, I, 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 in the book I shatter some myths. I talk about myths. One of the things I do that I didn't mention that I talk about myths that exist in the, Ara about Amer in the American mind about Arabs. I have five chapters, one on the fact that they're all the same. The other is that they're all so different that they're not even a people. And the third is that they're all angry. You know, Arabs go to bed at night hating America, wake up hating Israel, and spend the day in the mosque listening to a preacher, making them hate even more. Um, incidentally, that's not true. Um, when we ask them what the most important concerns they have in life are, and what are the things they think about most, it starts with their jobs, and then it's their family and kids, and then it's health care and education. Does that sound familiar? It's because they're like us. It's because they're basically like, when we ask what they watch on television, their favorite things are movies, old movies. And then after that are soap operas and dramas, and then game shows and reality shows and entertainment programs. I was just in, Egypt, I was just in Saudi Arabia during the Tunisia uprising when it first started. I had a funny incident. I was sitting in somebody's living room. There were 18 of us sitting there. And the news was on, and we were watching Tunisia and Lebanon. The Lebanese government was falling, and the Tunisia situation was unraveling. And the debate was hot and heavy. People were on different sides of the whole thing. And all of a sudden, the 28-year-old son of one of the guys comes in, and he says, It's on! And he goes to the remote control, and he turns the TV to Arabs Got Talent, which is a, a wildly popular show across the Arab world that is is. Actually, I had to admit, it was kind of fun to watch because it's a little like American Idol, but it's gimmickier. People do kind of, you know, strange tricks and, and it's sort of like, you know, the Letterman human tricks thing? Yeah, it's like that, but it's a whole show of that stuff. And then you vote on who wins. And um, uh, it was as hot and heavy watching that and debating who was better as it was when we were listening to the news. But they're not obsessed and they're not angry, and they know how to have a good time. And if you'd seen Tahrir Square, it was Woodstock. I mean, there was poetry reading, and there was music, and there were dancers, and there were, uh, you know, tents of, of, po of, of live entertainment all day long for people. It was a, it was a festival. And uh, the signs that people were carrying were hilarious, and the chants they were, they were, they were uttering were equally hilarious. That was not an angry crowd. But that's not the story we saw. And the other myths I have are that they're all fanatics or that they're stuck in the past and don't want to move forward. Um, so anyway, I tell audiences that this is a book about shattering myths, and I focus on that a little bit. And then I say, but there's one that's true. And I'm going to tell you right now. My father was a Lebanese merchant, and I got a book to sell. And I, so I go on from there. But um, I would uh, obviously appreciate it if you bought the book, and I'd love to talk to you about it. And I'd like to take any questions you may have right now. Uh, we can have a conversation for as long as, uh, as I'm here. Yes, sir. I don't think they say that we'll lose, but I don't think they say we're winning. And, um, and they, uh, they largely have the attitude at this point that it was a mistake to get in and, uh, and probably ought to get out. Yeah. And one might ask, after a combined total of 6,000 lives, at what point do we realize that it didn't, it didn't happen? But having said that, uh, there is a, a responsibility we have to do it right. 
As I've always said, the question is not how long you stay, but it's what you do between now and when you leave. And I don't think we've used our time there well or effectively. I just don't think we have. The problem with Iraq right now, more so than Afghanistan, although Afghanistan is quite turbulent, is that Iraq has always had regional implications. I mean, the first thing we did when we went into Iraq was we empowered Iran. I mean, why was Iran, why is now Iran a you know, craving regional power and hegemony? It's because Iraq's been defeated, taken out of their orbit. Um, and <coughs> with the Shia-led government that they feel that they can work more closely with than the one that was there before. At the same time, the Kurdish issue has now become one that has emboldened people in the Kurdish region. And that then sets off shockwaves across the border in Turkey and shockwaves across the border in Iran, which are the other two big Kurdish areas. It is a, um, it's a regional concern of what we did. Don't forget to buy the book. Um, and um, uh, and so I, I, I think that we're, we're not out of there yet. I think we're probably going to try to extend staying there a bit. But it's not a question of how long we stay, but it's what we do. And I just don't think we got it right yet. I just don't think we've got it right yet. I mean, there was one of the recommendations in the Iraq study group that I talk about in the book. That was to create a regional security compact, which everybody said, how could we do that? You mean bring Iran in? They're already in. I mean, Iran is already in Iraq. And Saudi Arabia is already in Iraq. And Turkey is already in Iraq. The question is, do you bring them in Iraq sitting at a table talking to each other, or do you keep them in Iraq under the table making deals and creating problems for each other? And so the idea of a regional security pact would help stabilize the situation and create a regional investment in security in the country, because every one of those countries have an interest in the future of Iraq, whether we like it or not. That's their neighbor. We're not. And if Iraq unravels, if it falls apart, uh, if it increases in turbulence, that is only going to spread beyond the country. I mean, already little tiny Jordan has about 700,000 Iraqi refugees living in it. And Syria has over one million Iraqi refugees in it. And they do not have the capacity of absorbing all of them. But those folks can't go back home. More turbulence, more refugees, and these countries will be buried with it. But thank you, George Bush. You did it, never acknowledged what you did. The Christian community in Iraq, for the Christian president to have done that, is one of the great sins in history. That was 1.2 million people. Today, there's 300,000 Christians left in Iraq. And they are in fear of their lives, most of them. It is a devastating situation. And yet, I don't see anyone in the administration even talking about the recommendations that the smartest group of Americans <coughs> ever assembled, the Iraq study group, came up with. I mean, they put forward the recommendations. Everybody bought the book, but nobody read it. And those that read it ignored it. And it's still there waiting to be implemented. Buy my book. We Sorry. have a mic for questions. Yes, right so. here. Hi. Sorry. I want to ask specifically why you frame this as a question of America, or white American, Christian America, being resistant to the idea of like Arabs. I mean, even recently, there is this poll in France that Le Pen, you know, the far rightist, is leading in the polls. Are Switzerland banning minarets? Yeah. Le Pen for two before he was, you know, assassinated. Yeah. What makes you feel as if this is specifically an American phenomenon resisting like this wave of like Arab Islamization? Well, it's not a specifically American phenomena, but it is uh, an American. I'm an American. <coughs> and I'm writing for an American audience, and it's my country. I mean, Switzerland won't let there be uh, minarets, but Switzerland's not fighting in Iraq, and Switzerland's not invested deeply in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And so as an American that is, whose country is so heavily engaged and invested and whose policies shape the destinies of 350 million Arabs, I, I, I'm writing to, to sort of correct some of the problems I see here because these are the problems that matter to me. Um, if if um, I have spoken in Europe, in capitals across the continent, about problems dealing with uh, anti-Arab or anti-Muslim, in particular in Europe, it's more specifically Muslim sentiment, uh, it's a serious problem. I, I'm aware of it, and like I say, I've addressed that issue there. Um, but. Uh, 
but this book was written uh, about the policy and what Americans don't know and what Americans do because we don't know and the mistakes we get into and the situation we got to get ourselves out of. Yes, sir. Could you talk a little bit uh, about what the uh, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the impact of those conflicts on America's ability to, to <coughs> facilitate positive change at this moment in history yeah. when, when there appears to be this, this, uh, yeah. this real desire and incredible uh, uh, uprising across yeah. the region let for me positive change? Let me tell you, I think you know, one thing that amazed me that we haven't talked about is that the Iraq War came about as a result of a, what was called the Project for a New America Century. It was a neoconservative effort that, that said, how do we, uh, we're, they're in da the danger they warned about was that at the end of the Cold War there was the danger of the emergence of a multipolar world and that America was going to lose the ability to drive the agenda for the next century. So the question was, how do we project American power to preserve our hege hegemony, our, hege our hegemony, hegemony, our hegemony, uh, for the next century, which was important, they believed, not only for geopolitical reasons, and, and, but also for economic reasons. Um, it would help us eclipse China and stay ahead of, of uh, Brazil and India and others. Um, and, and one of the things they actually came up with, I was in this, the working group in the Council on Foreign Relations when we first started debating it, right after 9-11 was that we needed to project power someplace in the Middle East to show folks we meant business and that we were not to be messed with. Um, and Iraq was the place they decided on. <coughs> what I always find intriguing is the fact that the war that was brought to us by the guys who wanted to project American power and preserve it for the next century ended up doing exactly the opposite. It showed us to be weaker than anyone ever would have imagined we were. We had a ragtag insurgency grind us to a damned halt. We have these guys in caves in Afghanistan that we can't beat. We have drained our treasury of a trillion dollars. Still want to blame the deficit on Democrats, but we gave ourselves a trillion dollar tax break and raced and spent a trillion dollars on two wars that we are not winning and probably can't win, uh, although we won't admit it, and are losing. And in the process of doing that, we roiled the entire Middle East and turned it against us. And then we said, you should all be Democrats. And then the minute they started voting in elections in Lebanon or in Palestine or in Egypt, guess who won? The people who hate us, because that's what happens in a democracy. The people who are the ones who win are the ones who have the most popular views. I mean, we ended up spending $5 million in the last week trying to support Fatah to beat Hamas. And when Hamas found out about it, they just did it, started an advertising campaign that said, America wants Fatah, but the people want Hamas. Turn the polls around. Fatah was winning by seven points in that last week, turned it around, and Hamas won that election. I mean, the result is, is that we weakened ourselves, we made our allies more vulnerable uh, because our allies like King Abdullah and Jordan were supporting us. They had to crack down on internal dissent <coughs> because the dissent was against them and against them supporting America. I, I tell the story in my book about I was in Saudi Arabia working with the Center for Strategic International Studies in a project they were doing on reform issues. And it was kind of an uh, interesting project. They were going to nine different countries and they were asking a series of questions of all different audiences. Um, and then uh, the questions were set, couldn't be changed. <coughs> and then we were going to put them all together in a report on how people felt about America's, <coughs> America's reform agenda. And. Uh, so we go to Saudi Arabia and they had me set up the meetings because they didn't know the folks there. And uh, the first meeting was with a group of liberals who were reformers in the Mejlis Ashura, which is the appointed Senate. <coughs> now the one guy who was leading this group was my definition of a reformer. He headed the Finance Committee. They had just been approached by the Minister of Transportation for a tax increase on highways. And he it was carried on Saudi 3, which is like their C-SPAN, and he threw a fit. He said, we are not giving you more money unless you show us the budget. How can we give you more money unless there's more transparency? And are the princes going to pay or just the people going to pay? I mean, a real reformer, you know, he was demanding accountability and transparency in the budget 
or no more money. And so he denied them the budget. It was on television and everybody was like, Abdurrahman, you're a hero. And people were stopping him on the street and waving at him and stuff like that. So the first question comes from the, the CSIS group. President Bush has announced a reform agenda. How do you feel about this? And he went ballistic. We don't want this reform. We don't need reform. We're the, you know, and the guy from CSIS turned to me and said, well, you said he was a reformer. I said, yeah, ask the question different. I mean, the operative word in the sentence was George Bush. This is after Iraq, after Abu Ghraib. I mean, this is not the guy that you see as, you know, I mean, we still want to think of ourselves as the, the, the white knight on the charger, but George Bush shot the horse. And we can't, rem we, we can't deal with that, that we've been discredited in this, in this game. It's a tragedy. I'd like us to be the agents of reform, but we're not. Next day, we went to meet the conservatives in the Mejlis and um, asked them the question, what do you think about George Bush's reform agenda? We love it. He said, we love it. We, want, we, we think it's a great idea. <coughs> so the, <coughs> the guys from CSIS were all excited. So I said, ask them the next question, why? Oh, he said, easy. He said, because our leaders have betrayed us and because they've sold out to imperialism and Zionism and they've humiliated the Islamic nation in the eyes of America. And therefore, we need your government to delegitimize them the way you did so we can overthrow them and have an Islamic revolt. It's like, okay, careful what you want, you know? And because if you don't know the damn people you're talking to, you don't know how to understand the answer to the question they're giving you. So yeah, I mean, the, 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 the Iraq and Afghanistan destroyed. And we will not be finished assessing the consequences of that for a long time to come. But I don't think we're ready to assess the consequences yet because I still don't think most of us even understand how deep the hole that was dug. Yes, right here, Brian. Um, do you think that the mentalities and actions of Americans towards Arabs and the Middle East can change? And if yes, I mean, how, how do we go about that? Oh, absolutely. I think that knowledge um, and experiences um, can, can go a long way in changing people's attitudes. And I think that there is an effervescence, and it's beginning with your generation. My brother has a book, um, and I don't buy his before you buy mine, um, but buy his. It's called The Transformation of the American Dream, and it's about the generational divide in America. And your generation is unique in our history in, in a couple of different ways. Um, the first is, is that the value orientation of your generation is fundamentally different than any other of the demographic groups in the country today. Um, it, 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 you, you define yourself differently. You see the world differently. He calls you the first globals. You see the world in a global framework. Um, you are more tolerant of, of uh, more, not just tolerant of diversity. Uh, it doesn't mean every person in your age group is, is, uh, is respectful of diversity. Um, there you got, you got your share of bigots too, but, but you're, you're more tolerant of diversity and not just age diversity, not, not just, I'm sorry, not just racial diversity or ethnic diversity, but also towards gays and lesbians and the, le I mean, you're, you're just a different, you know, group of people who actually feel differently about each other than any other age cohort. You have more passports per capita than any other age cohort. You've seen, been to more countries than any other age cohort. You have different ambitions that are more global in reach. Uh, my generation s was taught that patriotism was putting on a uniform and fighting a war. <coughs> Your generation grew up thinking patriotism was picking up litter and keeping our rivers clean and, and making sure that our cars don't pollute. Um, you see the earth as an entity that we didn't understand because you grew up. I mean, we went, you know, we, we were the first, our generation saw the first time the earth from outside from a satellite. Your generation grew up thinking that was just normal. And so you actually see the world differently. Now, the other thing about your generation that's different is that <coughs> um, you are leading. In my age group, we took our cue from up, up, up on top from the, the age generation that was beyond us. So it was that World War II depression generation. They defined the values that the rest of us absorbed. But your generation leads. 
and we're now learning from you. As I was going around the country campaigning for Barack Obama, I can't tell you how many places I went. It was a, I was in a Bangladeshi mosque. I was in a, a, a Hungarian chicken dinner in Toledo. I was in a Jamaican place in Queens. And every place I'd go, invariably, parents would come up to me and say, I'm here because my son or my daughter wanted me to come. I mean, it was like it was a children's crusade that brought, <coughs> that brought their parents into this. And, um, and you've taught us environmental concerns. You've taught us to be concerned about the globe. You've taught us to be respectful of diversity. It wasn't something we grew up with. You know, so, and on foreign policy, it's the same thing. I'm going from city to city and college campus to college campus. <coughs> I'm finding if the college campus now doesn't offer Arabic, a group of students get together and find their own, start their own Arabic studies group, and they hire somebody from the community to do it, and they raised money to send themselves to Egypt. They did that at Rice in Texas. They did it at Davidson in North Carolina. They went to Syria. I was in Cleveland. And this was a great one. I was in Cleveland, and a group of high school kids, 11 of them, had done the same thing, raised the money, got their parents to, to help them uh, to hire somebody to teach them Arabic. And, um, but it's the school they went to. They went to Chagrin Falls High. I mean, do you want a sweatshirt that says Chagrin on it? I mean, how cool is that? Um, and I never got one. But, but these kids are doing it on their own, and the Internet makes that possible. The Internet opens worlds that were closed to me, that I had no idea existed even. Um, so I am not... Hopeless. I am hopeful. Um, I'm hopeful that, in fact, we're learning and changing. And I see this, <coughs> this generational divide actually creating... I mean, it's no accident that the Tea Party is middle-aged, middle-class, and white. It's, there's no accident about that. It's, it's like, it's, it's my generation and its last gasp. It's like everything is changing too fast and we just cannot keep up with it. And on top of everything else, the American dream is dying, and it is. I mean, unfortunately, in our polling, we find that this is the first generation of Americans across the board who do not believe their kids will live a better life than they, and are worried just that their kids will keep up. I mean, the disaster of what happened to the housing market, the disaster of what happened to people's pensions, the loss of confidence in government and the institutions of government, it's like a punch in the solar plexus that just kept punching. You know, people started to get their wind back and they got hit again. <coughs> and in all of that, on the one hand, some people reacted with hope, saying, Barack Obama, show us the way. The hope was a little exaggerated, I grant you. It was a little exaggerated. But on the other hand, you now have this reaction the other way, which is, you know, I, I want it back the way it was. And so you get, jo you know, John Boehner talking about, the, bringing back the days of, of Ronald Reagan when we had uh, Bob Hope and Johnny Cash and he jokes about Hope and Cash but what he's really doing is joking about white guys who when everything was just great remember back then when everything was just great well it wasn't I remember back then and it wasn't great um, but the fact is is that we now have these, this deep generational divide on this stuff and I, I think that um, my generation is on the way out. <laughs> your generation's on the way in. And I, 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 I pray you don't lose your value orientation and that you continue to build on it and grow it and change. Uh, we find on foreign policy issues, your generation is far more open to change than, than my generation is and others. So I am not hopeless. And I, and I believe you're getting experiences and knowing what to do with them. Um, this yes, sir. Actually. This will be our last question. If you do have a question, please stay uh, for a reception and book signing after. Dr. Zogby will be available to answer your questions. And now look, they, they've got some books out there for sale, and if you want to buy them, please do. If you don't find them out there, we are signing some. Uh, you can pay for the book. We'll sign a nameplate, and you can, the bookstore will get it for you. Or you can just get it on Amazon. I shouldn't say that. The bookstore oh. needs your sales. But <laughs> the fact is, is that I'd sure like you to uh, get a copy if you, if you want one. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, I was going to ask uh, very simply. Do you think? Do you see the United States changing its policy towards Israel in the next decade or so? Um, no. Not 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 anytime soon. Not anytime soon. And I think that um, um, 
I've been doing this issue. Uh, this is actually what I started with. I mean, I started the Palestine Human Rights Campaign in 1976. Um, it's my life. It's something I've given so many years to and paid a pretty significant price for over the years, too. But um, uh, I felt hope back in the 90s. Um, but the hole at this point is too deep. And what's, what's happened is that you have pathologies on both sides. I mean, the Israelis are, uh, it's a fundamentally so sick, sick political culture. And the Palestinians are a fundamentally sick political culture. And the two of them need help. But the only adult around that could provide the help is us, and we're a sick political culture too, and don't have the ability to provide the leadership or the change that's needed. And so basically two peoples who have gotten themselves into a situation that neither of them can get out of on their own. And every time I hear, you know, when you hear a politician give a great speech and end with, but we can't do it for the parties. <laughs> I was with Bill Clinton in 1998 when he went to Jerusalem and went to Gaza and went to uh, Bethlehem. And he showed you can talk over the heads of those leaders and find people responsive, ready to listen and do the right thing. The leaders are incapable of doing it on both sides. The Palestinians are too weak and divided, and Hamas is just off the reservation, and the Israelis are just, it's a bankrupt political system with Netanyahu, who does not want peace but knows how to maneuver and lie with the best of them. Um, and so if you've got Hamas and, and, uh, and, 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 and Abbas, who doesn't have the power to do anything on one side, and Netanyahu on the other side, what's going to make this happen? And it's got to be leadership from outside, but that's not forthcoming. And the president tried a little bit, but backed off when, in fact, the political forces began to mount against them in this country. And now with Republican leadership in the House, uh, I don't expect him to be doing anything courageous uh, at all. Um, plus, everybody's telling him he's got bigger fish to fry at home. Now, this to me is devastating because obviously the longer people continue to suffer, the, the, the bigger it's going to get and the worse it gets. And it can get worse. It always can get worse. Um, but what I think, you know, I'm just waiting for and I think everybody's waiting for is the next explosion. Um, and I think it'll come. I, I don't think that Palestinians are going to let this Arab-wide revolt occur without uh, a response from them. I, 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 can, I cannot imagine, given the, the amount of training that's going on and the nonviolent demonstrations that are happening every day along the wall, that at some point you don't have a massive eruption of nonviolent demonstrations. And then we'll see how, you know, how does that juggle up the, the deck and make people start looking differently at it. I just, I just don't know, but um, you know, it, it's uh, we're, we're in for unfortunately a long slog on this one. One thing I think has happened, though, is that one thing that happened with this Arab revolt is that we will not see the same. No Arab government, whether they change or don't change, whether it's the same government or a new government, no Arab government will, at this point, turn a blind eye to what's happening to Palestinians as they have in the past because they now have to be re more responsive to their Arab constituents. In the past, they only needed to be responsive to America, and they squashed opposition. They're going to be afraid to be squashing opposition in the future. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Zogby. Again, we invite you all to join us for the reception and book signing in the back. Thank you.